this tallies in tens and scores and hundreds of thousands and then millions and tens of millions of darker skinned others being piled up in the name of profit maximization, stability for the strategic interest and ultimately economic interest of the United States. Actually, I talked about chickens coming home to roost after Malcolm X. But these chickens, I said, were more like ghosts. And I talked about those ghosts, the Iraqi ghosts first, the children. But then there's another half million adults in a country of 20 million people. And I talked about the Palestinians. And I talked about the Grenadians. And I talked about the Panamanians. And I talked about the Salvadorans and Nicaraguans. And I talked about the Guatemalan upland Mayans. And I talked about the bodies that were stuffed in the well at Nogunri. And I went backwards from Korea to a couple of nuclear bombings. We're worried about weapons of mass destruction in the country that has the largest inventory in the world and the only country that has ever used them on civilian targets and intentionally on civilian targets. <laughs> and pointed it out that while the nukes are best known, they weren't the worst of it. Curtis LeMay's carefully orchestrated fire raids conducted in the spring of 1945 in Tokyo, in one night alone, they inflicted 110,000 casualties, cremated civilians intentionally. They built burn zones out in Utah to figure out the best way to ignite wood and paper cities. This was deliberate, intentional. This was a matter of policy. Probably a half million Japanese were burned alive in the process of sending the message that they, too, would understand that what we say goes. And back to the liberation of the Philippines from the Spanish Empire to make it an American colony in the deaths of 600,000 to 1.5 million so-called moros, a pejorative term. Tagalog speakers called the Indians of the Philippines. Entire provinces deliberately cleared a population by virtue of liquidating them. Orders signed by American military leadership to kill every single male over 10 years of age. Oh, yeah, they didn't teach you that in high school history, did they? And Bill Owens doesn't want you taught about that now. And that happened 10 years after Wounded Knee and the reconstituted 7th Cavalry and the Hotchkiss guns and disarmed and immobilized people butchered in the snow and dumped into a mass grave. And I actually used the imagery from Wounded Knee in a book on gen comparative genocide juxtaposing the dumping of the bodies into the mass grave at Wounded Knee and the dumping of the bodies into mass graves by the Einsatz group in Eastern Europe, and people sometimes get them confused which is which. The symbolism and the reality are fused. The reality is what's at issue. And taking that string of massacres, running all the way back to when a group of people now known as the Wappinger, who supposedly sold Manhattan Island to the Dutch for a handful of glass beads and trinkets, objected to the idea that they'd sold their land because what they understood they did was accept rental payment for use of a particular portion of Manhattan Island as a trading center which they could do business with the Dutch. And the Dutch, who knew fully well that this had not been a sale but rather a rental, resolved the issue by sending a military expedition up the island to dispense with the Wappingers doing so so f rapidly that they felt that no one would believe how successful they'd been when they went back. So they took the heads of the fighting age males and the leadership and carried them back in woven baskets to display, to make proof of the fact that they had butchered the lot. And the citizenry was so happy they gathered round to watch a jolly sporting contest, kickball, in which the heads of the slain owners of the land were used as the ball. roughly on a place where the foundation of the World Trade Center was situated. Now, Ward, throughout your work, you've addressed um, the kind of colonizer mentality that believes that it can assign these kinds of values um, to other people. You've, throughout your work, written about the culture, the mentality driving genocide um, behind things like knee-jerk 
patriotism or the willingness to, ag to ignore U.S. abuses at home and abroad. Well, it functions on the basis of a, a set of values which take profit maximization and the uh, imagined entitlement to a certain material quality of life enjoyed by at least certain sectors of the U.S. population is paramount. And the concomitant of that has been the absolute devaluation, degradation, dehumanization, if you will, of others. Others, even within this society, American Indians being a prime example, but there are large sectors of the black population, the Latino population, and so on, primarily peoples of color, but not exclusively so. You could look to Appalachian whites, for example, to find an example of devaluation, dehumanization in a way within the white population itself. As being unworthy of participation, of, of being of no consequence, of being of no value, and that extrapolates then out to planetary proportions where you're talking about several billion people being rendered utterly irrelevant to the calculus of value that informs this society. And when you do that, when you do that to people and you follow through on that perception of them that like so much insect life, they can be eradicated at your convenience. Well, the fact of the matter is they are human beings and they're going to have a natural and inevitable response to being treated that way. That was the, the crux point of the argument. What happened on 911 was generated by precisely that. And I cited several examples that were probable in my mind of what it was that had motivated the attacks. And sure enough, within a week, the organization, Al-Qaeda, which had undertaken the attacks, named two of the top two on my list. I was two for two. The Iraqi children was named as a motivator, and the situation of the Palestinians was named as a motivator. The devaluation and degradation of those peoples, the consumption of their children in particular, in the interest of foreign policy domination, and that foreign policy domination undertaken in terms of economic interest and the desire to maximize profit were named as specific motives underlying the attack. The proposition that came out of that analysis with was that if you want to be in any sense secure from repetition of those attacks, here, try a simple biblical formulation, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, because they're going to continue to do it to you. You cannot do what you're doing to them with impunity even though you've devalued and degraded them to the point where they no longer count as human beings, they understand themselves to be human beings, imbued with the rights of human beings, and they will blow back on you what you are putting out to them.